Hello and welcome. This is Mouse Gunner, and we're back with some more automation. The Car Company Tycoon game, continuing on with the campaign roleplay of the Edison Car Company in 1986. So, uh, in this video, uh, so far in the year 1986, we have the uh, the Star and the Luna, and the next step is to build the Constellation, which is the large fleet sedan. So we have our small economy car, our mid-sized family sedan, and now it's going to be the large fleet sedan that we're going to be building. So let's go ahead and get into that. Okay, uh, first things first, get the year to the correct year, uh, obviously. So 1986, and which body we're going to use, I think is going to be pretty much the same body we used in uh, the previous go-around. I don't think a whole lot's going to change with the Edison Constellation. We've had a lot of changes with the other uh, cars in our lineup, but not so much with the Constellation. This is a little. This is probably the most traditional of the vehicles we have going. And then let's go ahead and set up our chassis. So this is going to be a ladder chassis. It's the only model in our entire lineup that has this ladder chassis, and I've already explained multiple multiple times why that is. But a lot of the reason why is we're also trying to use this uh, this vehicle to compete with uh, you know police contracts if we were able to get them. At least keeping that option open to us, and this would have been a pretty a popular and standard option for a police vehicle until very recently in the United States. So corrosion-resistant steel, and we're going to go with a front longitudinal mount. Uh, and then it's going to be McPherson strut and semi-trailing arm as our suspension setup. And we're going to, oh, well, you know what? I didn't notice that we now have corrosion-resistant steel for our body panels as well that's interesting i've been missing out on that with our other car bodies um you know what i think i'm gonna go with that uh for our our large fleet sedan it being a little bit more pricey but uh, let's see what the difference is because i don't remember corrosion resistant steel even being a thing that might be something that was added in an update or maybe it's something i just didn't know about because i've always been working in these previous time periods um, so looking at things, production units the same, weight the same, tooling costs the same, material cost is a little bit more it looks like, um, but in the end result, the main difference we have is corrosion resistance. It goes from very, uh, well corrosion I guess, not resistance, is very high and then average uh, for the uh, corrosion resistant steel. So obviously we're going to go with that. We want this to have a little bit of uh, ruggedness to it. Uh, and then that's pretty much going to be it. I'm going to do the styling uh, off camera as per usual, and we'll be right back. And we're back with the styling done. So looking at the front of the vehicle, I went with a dual, dual headlight setup. Uh, we're using the more squared off headlights. And kind of looking at things, I, I think I want to uh, maybe uh, drag the headlights over a little bit. Uh... There we go. In any case, dual headlight setup. And then when I, I went with these three indicators, and I'm not sure how well lined up those are either. There we go. A little bit better. I like the exact science, I guess. Oh, well, that'll do. In any case, I went with this three indicator setup because I kind of like the idea of having a, uh, you know, each light kind of going off in a succession, you know, when you turn on the turn signal. I, you know, it, there are some modern cars that do that and some older cars that do that. And I really like that look where, you know, it would go blink, 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 blink. I kind of like that look. So I went with that uh, with this vehicle was I think, thought that would be kind of a cool idea. The grill, I went with a little bit of a chrome look, although it's very much uh, squared off and... I'm still going for that kind of blocky look that we have in the 80s there. So uh, there we have the uh, the front of the vehicle. The side of the vehicle is pretty plain. But as I said, I tried to make this squared off and really blocky. And with the color I chose, again, I'm going with duller tones. Uh, and uh, we have the more plasticky look for the, the door handles here. And then the rear of the car is pretty simple. You know, just a couple uh, tail lights your badge, and your place for your license plate. So pretty simple, pretty plain, but uh, you have a little bit of flair up front here. So that's pretty much the styling, uh, and I'm probably going to have to have some of those changes come over. Uh, didn't really look like I saw much of a change. Anyway, 
Uh, and then we went with longitudinal rear-wheel drive. Obviously, I'm contemplating possibly doing all-wheel drive for this vehicle. Not 100% sure on that, though. Any case, uh, let's go ahead and set up the rest of the vehicle here. So uh, the engine we're using right now is this, the Constellations variant of the BS86, which is a 3 liter V6. And the power we can expect out of this is 139 horsepower and 162 foot-pounds of torque. So to kind of gauge where we are as far as the power goes, let's go ahead and jump into the trim here. So I don't think I'm going to make a manual transmission version of this car. I think I've pretty much abandoned that idea for this vehicle entirely. So we're just going to do automatics with this vehicle. And we're going to do four speeds, I think, pretty much across the board here. Uh, as per usual, I'm going to have to wait until it calculates everything before we know what our true top speed is. So we'll deal with the gearbox later. Uh, I think I'm going to go with an open differential for now. Uh, as far as the tire width, 175s are probably definitely not appropriate for this vehicle. 15-inch rims are probably fine. Go with medium compound tires. Uh, I, might, I might as well bump these up to, let's say, 205s to start. And we'll go from there. Uh, we're going to go with steel. And, you know, we're probably going to use these just normal. Uh, wheels, uh, maybe you'd put a hub, well, you would put a hubcap over that. As I still think that's pretty much the standard of the time. Uh, brakes wise, again, we're not going to do anything too outside the norm. We're going to go with solid, uh, two piston and drums in the rear. Uh, but we'll go ahead and make the brakes as big as they can be because that seems to be the way to go, uh, uh with most of the time with your brake setups. Uh, aerodynamics, uh, we're going to go ahead and go with, uh, fully clad. Get rid of the wing angle as we don't have a wing. And we're going to go with the, uh, what I usually go with, which is just a little bit, about 10 over what uh, it's asking for. So that would be around that 80 number. So we'll go there. And interior-wise, I think five seats. Go with standard interior, standard cassette, power steering as standard, and then standard 80s for our safety and with the suspension uh, more than likely I'm going to set it up uh, it's kind of a uh, going to either be standard or uh, progressive springs this is a little bit more you know softer comfort oriented vehicle so progressive springs might be what we go for but for now I think I'm just going to do standard uh, twin tube uh, passive and then do a normal preset um, but a lot of this could you know be changed later and there we get our initial numbers, which are actually really good to get above 40 with our initial numbers is, is looking good for me. In any case, I'm going to go ahead and do uh, the tweaks and everything and set up all my models off camera, and we'll be back in a bit. And we're back. Uh, <laughs> this actually uh, revealed some very interesting things to me, and it's kind of things I've been always saying. Uh, and we're going to be looking at that later, but essentially I have a number of trims for you guys as per usual. And we're going to start off with the standard 3.0, which is going to be your 3-liter engine variant with the standard trim, uh, all of these being automatics. Uh, we also have a couple premium variants, so we also have the 4.9-liter engine or our 300-cubic-inch uh, V8 that we will be putting in a little bit later. And then I have another trim for you that we'll be looking at. So we have two standard trims, two premium trims, and another trim to look at. Um, but first off, let's look at our standard 3.0. So going over what we did, essentially, uh, kind of, this is uh, a, a kind of change I've been doing with the gearboxes where I've been setting up the automatic gearboxes a little bit differently. In the past, I've been using that fourth gear uh, entirely as an economy gear, and I think what I was doing with that was getting not very realistic results, uh, not very much replicating what an automatic transmission would really be like. Or, frankly, maybe a four-speed gearbox would be like. So I've started making these uh, four-speed automatics where that fourth gear is kind of a little bit beyond our top speed, but uh, not entirely beyond our top speed. But even still, with this, we see spacing. Uh, I had to go very much less aggressive, 50 being your standard, because of wheel spin. As you can see here, if I go up even one point, bam, 5%. Bam, you just lost. Uh, what? 1.7 in drivability and 0.3 in sportiness by changing spacing by one. 
Now I improved my zero to 62 time by a whole tenth of a second with all of those deficiencies. But uh, there you go. Uh, any case, that's pretty much that. Uh, so I had to go pretty uh, unaggressive with that gear spacing because of how bad wheel spin is. And I've, you know, been hammering that point home a lot lately. But I think, you know, it is a uh, something that's worth mentioning considering seemingly how big of a problem it is. So as a result, I get a 0 to 62 time of 11 seconds, which is slow. Okay, moving along. Uh, we have my tire set up. I ended up going with 225 or 225 millimeter tires, both in front and rear. I think much wider than that, you're starting to kind of step outside the realms of reality, but uh, I think that's pretty decently sized for what kind of vehicle it is, 15-inch rims and all that. Uh, brakes, I went with my normal setup, solid, uh, solid two-piston and drums in the rear, and we have quite a bit of brake fade. Uh, and this is another thing. I think the brake fade's too aggressive after they've made that change where pad type has an, a reflection on uh, brake fade. I mean, this is a comfort-oriented car. Would I put a super aggressive sports brakes on this car? No. So I suffer pretty badly because of that, because of massive brake fade, 5.2% 5, 5 negative there. And this is on the least powerful trim. So uh, there you go. Uh, moving along, how I set up the aerodynamics. And I will point out that this graph is completely and totally bugged out, obviously. Um, and also, it looks like we have front-end lift. And that seems to be just a, a a feature of this body. As I said, uh, you know, some of these bodies have kind of unique attributes to them that you might not really be able to predict. And it doesn't really matter what you do. This body will always front lift on you. So there you go. Um, but you already kind of know how I set this up. Interior, again, you already saw me set this up, so not, nothing really different there. Uh, the suspension, uh, again, I, I usually go off the normal preset as I feel like that's usually the better option. Like, that's even better than going with comfort oftentimes because you get a lot of compromises to get that comfort, uh, and I think you're better off kind of going with a middle ground and then going from there. Oh, I guess one thing I didn't mention is I used uh, Viscous LSD to try and cut down on some of that wheel spin. Obviously, it didn't really work all that well, but uh, it helps a little bit. Uh, and moving along, uh, if we go back to the suspension, other things I did is I ended up going with progressive springs. As you can see, the difference here, most of you are losing out on cost and uh, also on sportiness. But you gain both in drivability and comfort, which is exactly what we're going for with this type of car. We have gas monotube, which is going to give us bonuses in uh, comfort as opposed to not getting those bonuses. We also get a little bit of a bonus in sporiness, but all of that's not really what we're going for. Uh, now, as far as the suspension, as I said, I went with normal preset. I did change it up a little bit. Uh, I know for a fact that I ended up stiffening the dampers in the front as there was a little bit uh, in, this, in this body bump uh, test here. And if we can even just show that, uh, it was a little bit harsh on that uh, front end there. So I just stiffen that up a little bit to kind of smooth it out a little bit. Again, this is a comfort-oriented car, so we're trying to go for that, kind of. Uh, and uh, otherwise, I don't think I really changed a whole lot. Maybe a little bit here and there, maybe with ride height. But mostly this is roughly the uh, normal preset for this car. So moving along, let's go ahead and look at all our detailed stats. So... Uh, oh, and things I didn't mention, uh, we had an economy of 22.9 miles per gallon. And let's go ahead and look at our detailed stats. So we have drivability, and as per usual, if you guys want to see this in detail, just go ahead and pause it. I'm only going to leaf through this stuff. So sportiness, comfort, prestige, and finally safety. Okay, let's look at our test track. Now, our test track results with the top speed 115.3 miles an hour and our acceleration 0 to 62 of 11 seconds. Again, I already said that's kind of slow. I expect that this will do better than our 1 minute 50 time, though. Uh, I, I would be surprised if it didn't. Uh, weight distribution-wise, not too bad, considering this is a front-engine car, rear-wheel drive. Uh, cornering G's, not too bad. Cornering speed's not too bad. This thing actually corners not too bad, honestly. Uh, so let's go ahead and look at... Now, you know, one thing that I, I, I might um, have been better off with, you know, is the uh, double wishbone suspension, both for comfort and a lot of these other stats. But uh, I think I wanted to keep things cheap, so I went that route. 
I honestly don't remember how I set things up in the past as far as the constellation. So I don't know if that was a deviation or not. Um, in any case, let's go ahead and run our time. And to keep this brief, I'm just going to go ahead and look at the time right now. So we've got 1 minute 45.4. So pretty good. That's probably one of the better um, performers out of our standard, you know, base trims that I've seen so far. Uh, which I guess makes sense because this is uh, the most powerful base engine we've ever used. Um, but there you go. Let's go ahead and jump into our next trim, which is going to be the standard 4.9. Okay, and let's look at the engine first so you can expect what, you know, see what kind of power you can expect out of this. So we're getting 234 horsepower and 266 foot-pounds of torque, so we're quite a bit of improvement over the V6. Pretty dramatic. As a result of that, wheel spin was out of control. So as a result of that, the spacing had to be even less aggressive by a significant margin. I think I also had to go up higher with the top speed than I did in the past, so this is much more of an economy, uh, you know, setup than I really wanted to, but, you know, you do have to do something about that wheel spin to get it down, and as a result, our Z62 time, even though we gained, I think, almost 100 horsepower there, we only gained uh, a little bit of time there in 9.3 seconds from that original 11 seconds, so that's still pretty bulky for as powerful of an engine as this is. Okay, so let's go ahead and look at some of our setup. So I didn't change anything with the wheel setup at all. Uh, rim offset. I did not remember setting rim offset. I Okay, there we go. Um, I'm going to get rid of the rim offset because that is not something that I remember setting up. And as a result, we see a lot of stat changes. I'm going to actually have to look at some of our other trims and make sure that rim offset does not exist because I never actually set it. Um, so that's interesting. Uh, again, this tire tab is just so buggy and it is sometimes very frustrating. Uh, when things like that happen. Let's see if it actually saves that change. Okay, it did. That's nice. All right. Um, uh, brakes again, nothing changed, but we see, uh, ooh, the brake fade. It's even worse. Uh, very bad, but uh, there's not a whole lot we can do about it, except for switching to different brake setup or just increasing that pad type to just unrealistic, uh, you know, unrealistic choices. This is a comfort-oriented car. I'm not going to put super race brakes on here. Okay, moving along. Uh, cooling airflow, obviously I had to increase that because we have a more powerful engine requiring more cooling uh, air. So there you go. Uh, moving along, uh, we have the same, you know, in interior setup that we had before. Now, for the suspension setup, obviously it's going to be different than it was for the V6 uh, as we're a little bit heavier and everything. But more or less, I went off the normal preset and I used the same kind of idea with a little bit stiffer uh dampers in the front and it's for the same reason just to kind of soften up that uh the impact in the front there okie dokie so uh, as far as miles per gallon goes obviously we drop down 19.5 and uh let's go ahead and look at our detailed stats so we have drivability we have sportiness we have comfort we have prestige and finally, we have safety. Let's look at our test track. So obviously, we gained in, in uh, top speed here, 134.8 miles an hour. Our corner Gs look like they were reduced a little bit. That kind of makes sense. A direct weight distribution is a lot more front heavy. So that's where you probably lost a lot of your cornering ability right there. And obviously, our Z-62 time is faster. So we can expect a quicker overall time. So let's go ahead and check that out. And again, to keep this brief, I'm going to go ahead and just do that really quickly. And let's look at our time. So we got 1 minute 39.82. Uh, so again, a lot of improvement there. Let's go ahead and just jump back into that standard 3.0 because I just want to check to see if that rim offset exists in this trim as well. Uh, because I, I, I really honestly did not. Yeah, see, look, it no rim offset. And I did not make a change at this tab at all when I switched to the V8. So I have no idea why that rim offset appeared. As I said, no changes were made on this tab at all. Zero changes. So don't know where that rim offset came from, but there you go. Now for the premium 3.0, I just want to show this briefly because I want to kind of discuss some things I did that were a little bit different so you can see them. So this uses the V6 and it has the interior set up differently. 
Because I knew I was going to be increasing that weight, I decided I would use that weight to my benefit. More increased weight means you have more weight uh, on the tires, which gives you more traction. So as a result, I made my gear spacing quite a bit more aggressive. So it was set at 39. I was able to up it to 42 without uh, losing any wheel spin. As a result, I didn't lose nearly as much time in the 0 to 62. Uh, so it's 11.1 seconds from 11 seconds. So uh, keeping those trims a little bit closer together uh, by doing that. Otherwise, these are pretty much exactly the same. I think I might have a little bit of... Uh, no, I guess it's not doing the calculations or showing the graphs correctly here. So again, no change here. No change here. Although the brake fade, uh, I don't know if it's, I, I would assume it's worse. The cooling airflow is the same. Uh, interestingly enough, this graph is not bugged out. Now, as far as the interior goes, uh, obviously we have premium interior, premium entertainment, and I also slapped on ABS as the option for the premium trim. Now again, suspension, this is going to be retuned for the weight balance uh, changes, but otherwise set up more or less the same kind of I, a way. And again, I'm not going to kind of, I don't know if I'm going to show detailed stats or the test track time. You're just going to have to use your imagination on that um, because I want to keep this video a little bit more brief. Uh, and I did the same thing with the premium 4.9. So making the uh, gearbox a little bit more aggressive. And we can see that really just quickly here. What kind of 0 to 62 time we're going to see. Because that's going to be one of the big changes uh, from one to the next. So we've got a 0 to 62 time of 9.3 seconds. I don't remember what it was with the standard trim, but uh, I'm sure you do because you can always, you know, back up the video or it's a little bit more fresh in your memory. Uh, any case, uh, you know, again, trying to, to lessen that gap. And we see spacing, I think it was 21. We were able to get it up to 23 before we started having wheel spin issues. And that's just due to the, diff the higher weight, giving us a little bit more traction. All right, now it's time to get into the ultimate trim. Now, uh... I did say that I thought about doing an all-wheel drive version. I'm not going to... All right, first off, I'm going to say, I don't know if this would be a real trim that would be in our lineup. This was actually done for educational purposes, I would say. And it was quite educational. So let's go ahead and pop into this and see what we have. Okay, uh, and obviously it wants us to recalculate things, so let's recalculate things. All right, so this is our direct comparison to, I think, our premium V8. And the main choice that change that I have between that premium V8 and the ultimate 4.9 with the V8 is all-wheel drive. That's it. Everything else has been just remodifications for that change. That's it. Okay? I just want to point that out. These are our stats. Look at the comparison. 53.3 versus 47.2. Sportiness. Oh, well, there is another change, and I'll point that out, and that's the brakes. We have sportiness 12 to 8.9, comfort 39.5 to 38.4, prestige 27.7 uh, versus 20.2, and safety 34.1 versus 32.9. Obviously, we're uh, spending more money, though, here, and there's a number of reasons for that. But first off, 0 to 62 time, 7.4 seconds. This is what you would get out of this car if you didn't have to deal with massive wheel spin. Why are we not dealing with massive wheel spin? Because of the power distribution. I have 40 going to the front, 60 going to the rear. It's a little bit more distributed, and we're using a lot more traction with our tires. But as a result, I dropped almost two seconds off the 0 to 62 time. Does that sound realistic to you? Even remotely. I just, I just want you to think about that. And, if, you know, if you want to draw a comparison in real life to real-life cars, all right, I, what I'd like you to do is I'd like you to look up a, a Porsche 911, you know, with the two-wheel drive and a Porsche 911 with four-wheel drive. And I want you to see the comparison in the 0 to 62 times. Is there a difference of two seconds? That's my question to you. I, I very highly doubt that. And in favor of the all-wheel drive car, I'll point out as well. So just draw that comparison in real life and maybe we have an issue there. Okay, moving along. So, uh, as I said, again, this is what would happen if you didn't have to deal with wheel, wheel spin. Now, let's go to our tires. Didn't ch change anything here other than the stupid rim offset, which uh, seemingly wants to pop in whenever it feels like. Now, we're going to lose a little bit of stats here, but uh, I want to keep everything consistent, so that's what we're doing. 
I probably need to change the premium 4.9 as well. I don't know why it did that with the, the V8s. I, again, I didn't touch this tab at all. Now, brakes. What did I do differently? I got rid of all that brake fade. So I put in a vented disc in the front, got rid of a lot of the brake fade. We still have brake fade, though. That's that's how ridiculous this brake fade is. Is even with a vented uh, a disc in the front and changing from drums to solid discs in the rear, I still have brake fade. Do you think the brake fade's a little bit much? I mean, these are the maximum size brakes. Any case, uh, the result of that is a lot of the stat increases that we have. I mean, look, let's just let's just uh, see what the brake fade would be like here. So we got over 10% brake fade. And look how much the stats dropped. They plummeted by five points. Not good. So again, brake fade, probably a little bit out of control there, in my opinion. All right, so there's our brake setup. That's why this is the ultimate 4.9, is because I did set up that just to, to showcase, you know, how much of a problem it is when you try and build a car that is realistic. You have massive brake fade to deal with. You have tons of wheel spin to deal with. It's just, it. I don't know if you end up with the results that you really would, honestly, in real life. Okay, um, let's go ahead and look at the test track of this thing. Uh, obviously, the, the suspension was set up slightly differently because of the, the difference in weight, weight dynamics. But let's look at our test track time. So, top speed, not quite as good as uh, our other V8-powered car, but not not much difference. I mean, it's 135 versus 133.5. Not a whole lot of difference there. So, the 62 time, though, 7.4. We definitely gained out there. Uh, and cornering Gs, uh, we lose a little bit, and it's, it's pretty front-heavy still, even though, well, yeah, it's probably even more front-heavy because of the all-wheel drive. But let's go ahead and see what our time is. Uh, and uh, also, I'd like to listen to the engine here. That's actually surprising. It looks like it's slower uh, than our other car. I wouldn't have never expected that. Um, but you notice how, when I start this thing up, how the power comes almost immediately, like a real car would, not, you know, counting the seconds. All right, so let's go to our, our well, first off, premium 4.9. And let's make sure that we don't have any rim offset, which it appears we do. Thank you. All right. I'm curious here uh, what our test track numbers of this are in comparison. But I want you to count the seconds here. I counted five seconds before we started moving. Just thought I'd point that out. But in any case... Um, let's see what our, our time is. So it's only slightly worse. That's very interesting. So as much as we have massively faster 0 to 62 times, for whatever reason, the all-wheel drive car is not that quick. That is very counterintuitive. Uh, and it's not like it's that much different as far as the handling department. So I'm actually puzzled and confused by that. Uh, very much so. Um, but let's look at our test track time. So for the standard one, it's still the same 9.3 seconds, 0 to 62. But let's look at our test track time because this is just, it just is baffling me how how illogical a lot of this is. But again, let's go ahead and run our time. Okay, so maybe I was misremembering things. So 139.82 versus what was the ultimate one. I know it was 139 something. All right. Let's go ahead and run that test track time here. All right, just stop it. One, three. So we only gained, what, half a second there? A little bit less than that? That's very surprising considering how much how much quicker this thing is. I mean, 7.4 seconds from 0 to 62 is a lot quicker. And there's not much of a difference in top speed. And cornering Gs, yeah, it's it's worse, but, I mean, not by much. I mean, it, 
I don't understand, honestly, uh, at all, e- even remotely. Uh, <laughs> you know, I mean, look at the quarter mile times. It's a difference of uh, one and a half seconds, and but the top speed isn't quite as high. I don't understand at all, uh, really, honestly. But it is what it is, and uh, as I said, educational, I guess. Um, but let's go ahead and look at everything. As far as the game is concerned, is the question here with 1986 Edison uh, Constellation. Okay, so as far as the game is concerned, uh, the the ultimate is by and far away the best trim we have. I mean, every stat on here is better than every other card. The only difference is, obviously, we don't have uh, the economy. The economy is worse. Uh, our reliability is exactly the same, even though you're having a more complex all-wheel drive system, which I'm not sure how much sense that makes. Uh, it looks like we take a little bit of a hit in utility. Uh, but the main hit we're taking is cost and production units. Because the main difference between the premium 4.9 and the ultimate 4.9 is the brakes and that all-wheel drive uh, uh, setup. So that's where we're getting a lot of that, that cost differential. And honestly, uh, probably a lot of that is the brakes. Uh, so that's pretty much it. Uh, <laughs> very interesting uh, looking at some of these things, and I think this highlighted a lot of my opinions about the way the game works right now, uh, that I, I think that wheel spin is a real problem, and I think showcasing a car uh, where you can get rid of a lot of that wheel spin shows you what the differences are and like what you can gain. I mean, as far as this game's concerned, in every way this car is better than it's it's you know, equivalent, you know, the, the premium 4.9. Now, obviously we could upgrade the brakes and that probably would do a lot, but I mean, look at how big the difference is. It's seven points in drivability. That's pretty big. Uh, and, <laughs> and that shows you, in my opinion, where that brake fade and that wheel spin are, how, why they're so detrimental because by having 10% or even 9% brake fade, you're losing like three points straight up just from that. Uh, so, any case, I hope you guys have enjoyed this video. This is Mouse Gunner, signing out.